as I have always known, but I'm in the habit of forgetting, humans are hilarious and very, very silly. So when I heard about a phenomenon called the Ikea effect, all I could think was, yeah, of course, that does sound like us, the silliest of geese. But it also kind of clicked a few things into place for me and the strange ways that I myself have been acting now that I'm in my 30s. Although, you know, a a huge global pandemic did kick in about the same time as my 30th birthday. So you really have to cut all of us born in 1990 some slack. We have literally no idea whether any of the changes we experienced were down to run of the mill. Everyone experiences this existential tectonic plates moving within us as we age or if it was, you know, those pesky unprecedented times. All I know is that around that time, I began slowly morphing from someone who would rather buy new socks than sew a hole shut, into someone who spent all of their waking hours wondering how the seams in her clothes worked. What happens when you try and conjure your own jumper from scratch with barely any knitting experience? And, considering how easy it's turned out to be, why all of my clothes don't have at least four pockets. Come to think of it, that time of my life did coincide with another prominent emotion. Helplessness. Now, I don't actually think we're any more helpless than we ever have been, but Boyd is carrying around a little black box broadcasting a showreel of all the things we can't control on it really hammer at home. And when that didn't work, the empty supermarket shelves and news of mask shortages really polished off the job. Of course, two camps, among many, that really benefited from a boom that year were YouTubers. Thanks for all the lonely I'm at home, so I'll put Lena on in the background views, folks. And home improvement shops, especially IKEA. The IKEA effect describes the phenomenon of valuing something more highly or having a closer attachment to it if we have a hand in the production of it. I'm, I'm serious, there's even Harvard papers with titles like Bolstering and Restoring Feelings of Competence via the IKEA effect. According to the Decision Lab, companies looking to increase their profits can exploit the IKEA effect by charging unnecessarily high prices for a product, even when the customer assumes the cost of putting it together themselves. Certain businesses, like IKEA or Builder Bear, have business models that are centred on having us pay for our own labour. We may overlook the fact that we're getting a bad deal to have the satisfaction of assembling it. While in commercial circles it's been seen as a clever trick for a very long time, Betty Crocker cashed in after a failed launch of their instant cake mix by changing the recipe so that you had to add an egg, which makes people, I guess, feel like they're bakers. And we ate it up. Literally. Instant bestseller. In business circles, it seems to be overall treated as a negative bias. A bad thing. Giving puffed up bosses a reason to think that their system is better purely because they invented it. But I can't help but think that maybe below all of that is actually a very sweet and potentially life-saving instinct. Look at anybody who's retired and you can see, we really want to make stuff. As much as we romanticise stopping working and having nothing to do, just looking out of the window and letting our lives pass by, we cannot help ourselves. Crochet blankets, whittled birds, garden sheds, allotments... And yeah, we can laugh, but I'm fascinated by what people do when they don't have to do anything. At school, I had very few subjects where you actually learn a skill or a topic from back to front, beginning to end. And even fewer where you learn how to make something you'd use in your everyday life. And perhaps that's because very few jobs require that. In his lecture, Art, Wealth and Riches, William Morris points out that Most kinds of manufacturing involves the process of labour being divided and divided and subdivided till a workman is perfectly helpless in his craft if he finds himself without those above to feed his work and those below to be fed by it. I got to my 30s and I realised that while I could churn out a mean press release or a vaguely competent profit spreadsheet, I didn't actually have a clue how to make anything. I actually needed to live or to put it more dramatically to survive william morris was probably right again when he said we do not seem to have quite cast off even the mere medieval superstition that handiwork is a degrading occupation to which i'd point out that it's kind of more than a superstition at this point we've made it 
a self-fulfilling prophecy because thanks to some bloody good journalism and campaigning, we, the people who are buying the goods, like clothes, for example, are starting to learn what goes into making them and uh, it's pretty hard to unsee. Handiwork being a degrading occupation is a superstition, as William Morris calls it, or maybe just an observation that pushes those of us who grew up in middle class households or striving working class ones to shy away from vocational skills in favour of academic ones, even though this is the average salary of someone with a degree like mine, and this is the average salary of a roofer in the UK right now, which, you know, they totally deserve. They saw it coming. All we go on about is getting a job to keep a roof above our head. And they were like, yeah, roofs. That sounds like a pretty future roof job opportunity. You might or you might not know that 2024 is my year of make do. A year long vow to myself that if I want to add anything to my wardrobe, I have to make it myself. Yes, even knickers. Of course, this project of me making my own clothes is great, but I'd be delusional to call it making clothes from scratch, really. I don't know the first thing about weaving fabric or dyeing fibres or shearing sheep, although I am more than willing to have a go, but the act feels somehow redignifying. Being able to look after myself in some small, silly, sacred way. And while so much of the web of exploitation I was born into is out of my hands, taking back some of that process and refusing to outsource it under conditions I disagree with. That feels like less like a noble act and more just a, a relief. Maybe it's just a gesture or maybe it's the start of something more radical. All I know is that if we're going to resurface out of the way things are set up now and we can't stay as we are, none of us can, it's quite literally killing us. We're really going to have to have a good sit down and a think. And the fact that the IKEA effect is so ridiculously effective, even though their instructions being incomprehensible and their products flimsy is a meme at this point, they are still the world's largest furniture retailer. And that gives me some kind of twisted hope, you know, that we not only can do stuff for ourselves, but on some level, we really want to. And I wonder if we indulge that instinct, what we all do with all that restored gumption. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you like this video, don't thank me. Thank the Gumption Club. They tip me per video to make sure these videos keep happening. If you like this video, I reckon you might like one of these. Frog's not out.